Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. So we have some new filings in the case of Jeanette, Janet Braun and Lauren the Mortician suing people are mean to me on the internet. No, really, they're suing Becca Day, Caffeinated Kitty, and the host of the Do We Know Them podcast because people are mean to them on the internet. Uh, Lauren the Mortician is upset because she says people were calling her a turf. And Jeanette Braun is upset because she says people were calling her essentially a bad lawyer. So let's have a look at the new filings because they're a real peach. That's kind of a, a joke based on what'll be coming next. So this starts off and this is caffeinated Kitty's uh, response to basically say, I need more pages. So there's a deadline of February 29th and caffeinated kitty says, I need more space because memorandums are limited to 15 pages and caffeinated kitty's counsel says we need 27 pages. Why? Well, because there's two people suing, but also because they throw a lot of garbage at the wall to see what sticks. And because there's a lot of different legal arguments that have to be addressed. So they say, listen, we could file two 15 page memorandums, but how about you just let us file one 27 page, which sounds really boring, right? More pages, please. But it ends up with the proposed memorandum is attached to this motion as exhibit one. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> because that means we get the full proposed memorandum. So this is a little ahead of schedule taste of what we're going to see on the 29th. And I could not be more excited. All right. So we have defendant caffeinated kitty, the owner and operator of caffeinated kitties memorandum of, of points and authorities in support of the special motion to strike pursuant to George's anti-slap. Hence the peach comment. Cause George, yeah. Okay. Moving on. Uh, or in the alternative, motion to dismiss for the federal rules of civil procedure. Okay, so you can see there's a whole lot of stuff here. We're going to skip right to it because, yeah. Um, I also really like their layout here with, like, here's our statutes, here all of this, but yeah. So, introduction. At its core, this action is an attempt by an alleged well... <laughs> <laughs> an alleged well-known social media influencer with millions of followers. Um, okay, we're already starting with some shade and I, I'm here for it. Uh, and her lawyer to silence an individual who has voiced opinions about them on social media with which they disagree. And I'm just going to say, if you get to millions of followers, people are not going to like you. There's going to be people, obviously, who do like you, those millions of followers, but you're also going to get people who think you suck. And we'll say that a lot. I mean, I'm not at millions of followers, and I already get that, so get over it. So while plaintiff Lauren Propson, Propson, that's Lauren the Mortician, and her lawyer Jeanette, Janet Braun, and Braun IP Law, collectively, they're just going to call those two Braun, may not like what defendant KC, that's caffeinated kitty, the owner and operator of the social media account Caffeinated Kitty has to say about them on TikTok. The allegations of the complaint reveal that Caffeinated Kitty's alleged statements are nothing more than her opinion, her subjective beliefs, and at worst, hyperbolic name calling. They're not actionable as defamation as a matter of law. So let's talk a little bit about defamation. Defamation protects you from people spreading false facts, but it doesn't protect you against people having opinions about you. Um, a comment to say, hey, Runkle, you suck, is an opinion. I mean, there is no sort of way you can translate that to some factual thing. Whereas if somebody says, hey, Runkle, you committed a murder or something crazy like that, that would be a factual comment that possibly could be addressed under defamation. So basically, the response here is to say, these are opinion, these are beliefs, and you can actually call people names. You know, you can say Janet. That's that's fine. That's not defamatory. Uh, that was actually one of the things Janet put in her complaint. Like, they're calling me Janet. Well, they're allowed. Um, not one of the alleged defamatory statements is a verifiable statement of fact. Not only do these statements not constitute defamation under the applicable substantive state law, but importantly, 
they fall within the scope of protected activity under the Georgia anti-slap statute, which governs Georgia speakers such as Caffeinated Kitty, who the complaint alleges is a resident of Georgia. So this I find really interesting because I'm Canadian. So now I'm getting into some really interesting aspects of U.S. like where the law applies, you know, jurisdiction issues. So put simply, this case is nothing more than a joint and inappropriate attempt by a lawyer and her client to bully and intimidate an individual for speaking her mind and exercising her First Amendment rights. Indeed, the complaint itself reveals the lengths to which plaintiffs will go to harass Caffeinated Kitty for voicing her opinions, namely, calling the police in Georgia and sending them to conduct a wholly fabricated wellness check on Caffeinated Kitty. And you might say, wait, is this lawyer going to get sued for defamation? Not for putting it in a court filing, he's not. So, um, then you might be saying, is this going to be a big focus? Is this majorly relevant to his, uh, you know, to his process here? Nope, he's just getting to throw this in purely just to point out to the court how messed up it is to call in a wellness check on somebody because it's really messed up. Like, that is insanely messed up. So, because plaintiff's allegations of defamation are based on statements that are a protected activity under Georgia anti-slap law and are legally deficient and non-actionable, the Georgia anti-slap statute mandates that all nine causes of action asserted by plaintiff against caffeinated kitty, all of which arise out of the alleged defamatory statements, be stricken, and here's the fun part, and attorney's fees awarded to caffeinated kitty. So, and she gets paid back for all of this hassle at Braun and Lauren's expense. Hmm, fun. Alternatively, yeah, Caffeinated Kitty respectfully requests that this court dismiss all nine causes of action asserted against her for failure to state a claim under the federal rules of uh, civil procedure, given that, as explained below, all of the claims rely on alleged defamatory statements that simply are not actionable under applicable law. Alternatively, and at a minimum, Propson's claims against Caffeinated Kitty, which are curiously joined with Braun's claims, this is a very polite way, because it's a court filing, it's a very polite way of saying that the joining of those two claims is complete bullshit, because Braun's claims have nothing to do with Lauren's claims, other than the fact that they're against the same people. Um, so the curiously joined is like, hmm... How about that? Isn't that some BS? Um, <clears throat> should be dismissed under federal rules of civil procedure for improper venue because Propson is a Wisconsin resident, Caffeinated Kitty is a Georgia resident, and this venue has no nexus to involvement with or interest in the adjudication of Propson's claims, i.e. throw it out because it shouldn't be in Illinois. And you might be saying, well, what does that do? Won't they just refile in somewhere... I don't think they're going to. Um, there's some really interesting things about, you know, how they're sharing a lawyer. And, I mean, there's really only two reasons why they might be sharing a lawyer. One, uh, some real dumb might be going on. And I can't rule that out. I mean, this could be, as I said before, just pigeon business, where they're just doing stupid stuff because they can't, they don't know any better. But... I think it's a cost-saving measure. I think that there's they don't really want to spend the money here for the two lawsuits, and if they get kicked to a separate to another jurisdiction where it would have to be a separate lawsuit, well then now it's more expensive, and maybe they're not so keen. And yeah, um, also if it's in Wisconsin, I don't know. I have some suspicion that maybe the Illinois lawyer is doing this on the cheap. Maybe he's doing it as a favor. Maybe he's doing it to get his, you know, get his uh, sort of feet wet in this. But uh, if he's forced now to travel to Wisconsin, that starts ratcheting up his costs if he wants to get involved with this. So he might not be so keen. It's a lot of plane trips. So background, case background. Plaintiff Lauren Propson is a social media personality and plaintiff Jeanette Braun through plaintiff Braun IP Law, collectively Braun, is her lawyer. Complaint docket number one, the complaint, uh, so that's the source of that. Propson is a licensed mortician residing in Wisconsin 
who operates a social media account on TikTok under the name Lauren the Mortician. Propson alleges that she has amassed millions of followers on TikTok. Now, I mean, they could check this, but the alleges is funny. So, as well as sponsorships and monetization of the video she posts on TikTok. Um, now, that says of TikTok. A uh, little spell checking would be good. I faulted Braun and their side for not spell checking. Same thing applies here. I'm sorry, I gotta say it including a brand partnership with a famous documentary channel. Propson alleges that her lighthearted and educational videos posted on TikTok discuss death, the love, loss of loved ones, and demystify occupations and professions that work with deceased persons. Also, she gets into fights with creators who actually know things about things like car seats. So um, that's another side aspect of her channel where she'll, you know, tell Mr. Grayson, who is actually an expert in this field that she knows better because she's seen dead people um cool i mean i've seen dead people too but it doesn't make me a car seat expert so propson hired braun a lawyer to assist with her copyright infringement claims by filing a digital millennium copyright act dmca complaint to social media platforms hosting a video created by one of the defendants who the complaint names as caffeinated kit or KC, the owner and operator of Caffeinated Kitty. The complaint alleges that Caffeinated Kitty, that's just what I'm going to use, is a social media personality and is a citizen and, citizen and resident of Georgia. The complaint alleges that Braun, who resides uh, and is licensed to practice law in Illinois, filed a DMCA complaint with the social media company Meta, also known as Facebook, um, on behalf of Propson to remove from Facebook a post created by Caffeinated Kitty on the ground that Caffeinated Kitty's post used Propson's copyrighted material. The complaint alleges that Meta approved the DMCA removal request fire, filed by Braun on behalf of Propson and it removed Caffeinated Kitty's post from Facebook on November 4th, 2023. Now, just as a note, the DMCA is basically set up to really favor removal as opposed to leaving content up. It is risky for the company to leave content up, um, and in fact, we have seen several instances where Braun sends very threatening responses or threatening sort of communications to these companies saying like, if you don't take this down, I could sue you. So um, that's why stuff gets taken down more readily than it gets left up. Robson has not asserted any allegations of copyright infringement against Caffeinated Kitty in connection with her alleged use of copyrighted material in her Facebook post. You think if she was going to sue, she'd throw that in, right? Rather, this action is based on allegations that Caffeinated Kitty posted videos on another social media platform, TikTok, in which she made alleged defamatory statements about Propson and Braun. Why wouldn't you throw in the copyright claims? Like, why federal court hears copyright things? You could throw that in, right? And you think that this is not, that these were not protected communications, why wouldn't you throw that in? Could it be that on further review, you knew that was bullshit? Hmm. Hmm. That seems like a possibility to me. Because, I mean, copyright claims come with, you know, fun statutory damages. You can get money for them. It's, it's, you're already suing. Don't you think your copyright claims were meritorious? Okay. <laughs> so, based on these alleged defamatory statements, Propson and Braun both assert claims for defamation, false light, and trade libel against Caffeinated Kitty. In addition, Propson asserts claims for tortious interference with contract and intentional infliction of emotional distress against Caffeinated Kitty, and Braun asserts a claim for tortious interference with business relationships against Caffeinated Kitty. And now they're going to explain how this is all BS, and it's going to be fun. So, Defendant Caffeinated Kitty's alleged defamatory statements regarding Propson. Propson alleges that on or around October 24th, uh, Caffeinated Kitty published a video on TikTok and identified her by her public persona, Lauren the Mortician, which is, of course, what you would do. And there's a link. The complaint contends that in the post, uh, Casey accused Propson of being transphonic. Um, that actually should be transphobic. Again, proofread. 
proofreading good. Um, they're under a time pressure, but proofreading good. Um, if you're watching this, fix this when you when you file the official version. Okay, cool. Um, and a turf because she liked posts by a social media personality who is in a gay relationship. The complaint alleges that turf is a derogate is an no it should be a derogatory slur, highly offensive term, an acronym standing for trans exclusionary radical feminist which is a term used to refer to or describe an advocate of radical feminism who does not believe that transgender or people's identities are legitimate and who is hostile to the inclusion of trans women in the feminist movement. The complaint then sets forth screenshots from the TikTok video in which plaintiffs allege that defendant KC accuses Ms. Propson of being a TERF and transphobic. One of the screenshots depicts a picture of caffeinated kitty with the text, Laura the Mortician is a turf. Okay. The other screenshot uh, is a, depicts a picture of Casey, again, proofreading, with the text, unfriendly reminder, we see transphobic, so we're saying transphobic. This ain't bull, or that ain't bullying, it's an astute observation. Boondocks 2014. And bi people can be transphobic. Um, Boondocks, I think, is a reference to the comic slash TV show slash, yeah. So, neither of the screenshots depict any text stating that Propson is transphobic. I mean, you can read between the lines, right? Um, but, yeah. Um, I'd make this argument. I don't know if it's going to be successful because I think you can read between the lines to say that it's an allegation of transphobic. That said, um... Transphobic is directly on parallel with things that have been found to not be actionable under defamation. There is prior case law to say that calling someone a racist or a bigot is not actionable under defamation. So I don't think this matters, but I mean, you put it in there. Robson alleged that in explaining her reasons for her accusations, defendant Caffeinated Kitty stated that she was not accusing Ms. Propson of being transphobic because Ms. Propson has a larger fan base and following, but because people were confusing Ms. Propson's Lauren the Mortician persona with defendant Caffeinated Kitty's persona. Now, I don't know why you would. I mean, people on the internet do some dumb things sometimes, so it does happen, but I mean, I've watched some of Caffeinated Kitty's videos. I've watched some of Lauren's videos, and I'm like, these are very different people. Um, the complaint further alleges that in the TikTok post, Caffeinated Kitty also announced that she compiled a list of links to posts that Ms. Propson liked that contained transphobic and hateful rhetoric. Amusingly, um, Lauren has never denied that that was a correct list of links. I mean, that might have been something you could say was actionable, but there's no denial that the list of links was correct. Probably because I'm guessing, I mean, I haven't checked, but it might have been correct. Otherwise, why wouldn't you put that in? I mean, this is either incompetence on the lawyer's part or, yeah. The complaint depicts another screenshot of the TikTok post that depicts a picture of caffeinated kitty over the background of a social media account profile for an individual named Anthony Ramondi under the profile name Conservative Ant, which indicates that Lauren the Mortician follows the Conservative Ant account. The screenshot further depicts a comment from caffeinated kitty stating that I'm not one for drama, but when I'm getting confused for someone, it becomes my business. And I value being thorough when it comes to addressing any accusation against someone else. Is it too much to ask that people hate me for who I am? Anyway, take my information and do your own research if you'd like. But refusing to address why hateful content is so likable smells like cowardice to me. I'll post my link in the comments for y'all, but do not comment on this guy's derogatory stuff. It's rage bait for a reason. The complaint alleges that upon information and belief, none of the videos Caffeinated Kitty linked contain transphobic and hateful rhetoric, and upon information and belief, defendant Caffeinated Kitty's motive and intent behind these posts were to tarnish and damage Ms. Propson's reputation. Now, what does it mean to be transphobic? I mean, people have very different views of this, right, as to what that means. What does it mean to be hateful? People have very different views of this, where the standard is. These very much seem like statements of opinion as opposed to statements of fact. 
When viewed in its entirety, it is apparent that the statements made by Caffeinated Kitty in the TikTok post are limited to statements by Caffeinated Kitty that Propson actively follows and likes social media posts that contain transphobic and hateful rhetoric. Those are in quotes. And, and see request for judicial notice. And because Caffeinated Kitty finds such rhetoric offensive, she does not want people on social media to confuse her for Propson or her Lauren the Mortician persona. So, nowhere does she state that Propson or Lauren the Mortician is transphobic, or has made specific transphobic statements herself. Rather, only that she's liked posts by other individuals who have made transphobic statements. I mean, it's a distinction, and I don't know if the court's going to bite in on this distinction as much as I think they will like some other stuff. That said, defamation law gets really picky. Really picky. And I think this might be good enough. I mean, I think that this is, this is a problem. It's just, I don't think this is the bombshell. Um, so nowhere in the complaints do plaintiffs allege that Propson has not liked these posts or follow, follow these individuals on social media. Whoops. Um, you'd think you'd do that. You would think you would do that. Um, and now you get a public calling out for basically, you know, for not disagreeing with this in your filing, which is where you would do it. So if you want to not have more attention on you liking transphobic statements or social individuals on social media, maybe don't file the lawsuit because um, I feel like there's some Streisand effect going on here in a big way. Moreover, nowhere in the complaint do plaintiffs allege any facts demonstrating that any statements made by Caffeinated Kitty in the TikTok post are false. All she does is just says, I'm not transphobic, but there's nothing really there to it. So alleged defamatory statements regarding Braun. This is going to be funny, by the by. So as stated above, Propson hired Braun to file a DMCA complaint with Meta regarding the alleged use of Propson's copyrighted material in a post on Facebook, not TikTok, which Meta approved. The complaint alleges that Caffeinated Kitty then used her social media accounts to express her anger and resentment of Braun. Okay, um, yeah, I did. I don't think that's correct in the sense of like, I don't think Caffeinated Kitty was expressing anger or resentment. I'm not, I'm not like perplexed by this filing. I'm perplexed by the bit the filing is quoting. So... Specifically, plaintiffs allege that on November 21st, Caffeinated Kitty posted a video accusing Ms. Propson of using Attorney Braun to file bad faith copyright claims with social media platforms, and in the same video, Caffeinated Kitty accused Braun of filing bad faith copyright strikes against defendant Caffeinated Kitty. Um, now, this could be a matter of opinion, but you would think that if they thought that these copyright claims were good, they'd have thrown them in the lawsuit, right? I think it's going to be really hard when they get to their whole, you know, discovery and, you know, depositions to address like, hey, you thought this was a good claim. Why didn't you sue over it? You were suing already. So you think it's a good faith claim, but you didn't feel like it was important. Did you not sue over it because you just really like Caffeinated Kitty and Becca Day and all of them? Like, come on, it makes no sense. So, contrary to the allegations in the complaint, nowhere in the TikTok post does Caffeinated Kitty state that uh, the Bra that Braun filed bad faith or false copyright claims or strikes against Caffeinated Kitty. To the contrary, Caffeinated Kitty does not even discuss the copyright strike for most of the video. Most is doing a lot of heavy lifting there, let's be fair. Rather, Caffeinated Kitty describes how Braun called the police and sent them to Caffeinated Kitty's home in Georgia to conduct a wellness check, uh, which Braun agrees with. She put that in her own file, like that, that's in their filings. Um, as well as how Braun sent Caffeinated Kitty a cease and desist letter on which Braun copied Caffeinated Kitty's mother and a theater company with which Caffeinated Kitty is not even affiliated. That's the funny stuff. Like, hmm, why would you do that? Plaintiffs further allege that on November 21st, 2023, Caffeinated Kitty created a page on the donation platform called GoFundMe and posted on this page a portion of a cease and desist letter that she received from Braun. 
The complaint alleges that on December 8th, 2023, Caffeinated Kitty published on the GoFundMe page her email response to Braun and falsely claiming, sick, that attorney Braun, I'm just going to say, if you're going to use the sick in your thing, proofread. That's the problem for both sides here. Um, that attorney Braun filed a false copyright claim and that she was a fan of Lauren the Mortician and was not actually retained to be Ms. Propson's attorney. We're going to see that that actually is bullshit, but yeah. The complaint sets forth a screenshot of the GoFundMe page update from December 8th, 2023 that reflects Caffeinated Kitty's email response to Braun regarding allegations of copyright infringement. It states in relevant part that Caffeinated Kitty would, and they're quoting here, love further details on Braun's client and how the video had grounds for a copyright strike as it clearly falls under fair use. I do understand how you've reached out with cease and desist to smaller content creators speaking negatively about Lauren the Mortician scandals. And while I understand your desire to protect a creator you enjoy, if you were not legally obtained as counsel for her, and I speak on this via my platform, your actions are going to cause her significantly more strife. This doesn't seem like a, I don't think you were the lawyer. It says, I don't know. Are you the lawyer or is this weirdness? This is getting into the whole thing of Janet's actions seem to fall into pigeon business where we just don't know if there's a strategy behind them or if it's just weird. <sighs> okay, let's keep going. Plaintiff's claims should be stricken under the Georgia anti-slap statute. So first is the Georgia anti-slap statute applies in this case. So this is really interesting to me because they filed it in Illinois. And so I'm going... Wait a minute, how do they get Georgia back in here? And so they're going to explain. And it's interesting. So in the case of an anti-slap statute raised as a defense to a defamation claim, the choice of law question regarding the anti-slap law is treated separately from whether a statement is defamatory because the anti-slap question involves whether a statement is privileged, not whether its content is defamatory. So privileged statements, what does that mean? Um, some places you have a right to say things, including things that might be defamatory. For example, in a lawsuit, so long as you're not sort of falling outside of, I guess, a sphere of what we'd call acceptable behavior, um, you can sue somebody and make allegations and that's going to be privileged. If you are called to testify as a witness and you say something that somebody doesn't like, they can't sue you for defamation because it's privileged within that court process because we think the court process matters. So that's sort of a privilege. And some of these laws basically act to create a privilege. And so they cite some case law here. I'm not gonna go through all of the case law. This video would be like 17 hours long. Um, it's already going to be long, but we don't need it to be 17 hours. So pursuant to depicage, now I had to look that word up. That is a $10 word and it is from French. It basically, I mean, they're, they're going to explain it, but I wanted to look up the etymology of it, what it means and so forth. And basically it means dismemberment or chopping someone up which I feel is really appropriate given that this is, you know, Lauren the Mortician and Caffeinated Kitty. I feel like it's on brand for both of them. So excellent term. Um, this is not something that comes up a lot, especially in criminal law, which is my usual thing. So the court can apply different states' laws to different elements of the lawsuit. Essentially, so one part might be using one state's law, another state part might be using another state's law. All of this gets really complicated, but it's allowed. So although the place of alleged injury might be critical in determining the law applicable to the defamation claim, i.e. Wisconsin or Illinois, the choice of law for anti-slap protection involves different interests, namely protecting the speaker's exercise of First Amendment rights and could lead to the application of different state law. In these anti-slap laws, which purport to protect the residents aren't all that useful if you can just dodge them, you know, because you set it on, on the internet and they can basically sort of often people will be able to pick their forum. So namely in determining which law to apply to defenses raised pursuant to anti-slap statutes, courts have found the place where the allegedly tortious speech took place 
and the domicile of the speaker central to the choice of law analysis. That is fun. So when I said this is a real peach, it's because this ties back to Georgia. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to explain that anymore. Um, yeah, so and this, they cite a case here which applied Washington's anti slap statute when the defendants were citizens of the state of Washington and their alleged def allegedly defamatory speech, though eventually published in Illinois and on the Internet. Hmm. In Illinois, huh? Illinois, you say? I wonder if we've heard of Illinois before um, and on the Internet. We've heard of the Internet. OK, <laughs> originated in that state. Here, the complaint alleges that Caffeinated Kitty is a citizen and resident of the state of Georgia, and there's no allegation that the alleged defamatory speech, while eventually published on social media and the internet, originated anywhere other than Georgia. Thus, Georgia has a strong interest in protecting Caffeinated Kitty's speech, and the Georgia anti slap law applies to plaintiff's claims against her. So, yeah, and this holds that the Georgia anti slap statute, they've got a case for this, does not directly conflict with a federal rule of civil procedure, and thus is substantive and can apply in federal court. I'm just going to say, um, I went through a, not all of these cases, I'll admit, I went through a bunch of these cases. And I'm going to say, I really like their lawyer because. Either this guy is somebody who knows this area in and out and various different jurisdictions, or, um, or he's somebody who's got really good research game because he's had short notice to do all of this. I mean, he did get an extension of time, but um, props on his research game. <laughs> so, I mean, assuming that these don't turn out to be like chat GPT hallucinations, but... The ones I looked at didn't, so I think we're good. Um, caffeinated kitty statements constitute a protected activity under the Georgia anti-slap statute. Under Georgia law, the analysis of an anti-slap motion, um, I guess I should have explained what anti-slap is. So slap is strategic lawsuit against public participation. And what people were noticing is that um, various people who were activists or whatever else, they would start opposing like a mine or an oil company or whoever, and they'd get sued on the basis that their opposition was defamatory. You went to a meeting about whether or not we could bulldoze this mountain, and you said that our company is an environmental disaster, and so we're going to sue you for that. And it's a great way to bully your competition, like your bully your critics. Well, anti-slap motions were intended like these anti-slap laws were created to protect against that they provide for substantial protections typically including this ability to make an advance uh, application to throw the case out and often including attorney's fees which um, we see here it, it's going to be fun so first the court must decide whether the party filing the anti-slap motion has made a threshold showing that the challenge claim is one arising from protected activity. This is like a, a base sort of level. Um, if so, then the court must decide whether the plaintiff has established that there's a probability that the plaintiff will prevail on the claim. So is the claim BS is what this comes down to. A protected activity under the statute is one which could reasonably be construed as an act in furtherance of the person's or entity's right of petition or free speech under the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of the state of Georgia in connection with an issue of public interest or concern. Now, I know what Braun's position is going to be is this is defamatory and so it's not free speech under the Constitution. Mm, yeah, that's putting the cart before the horse. So, yeah, I, I don't think this is going to be a problem, but they're going to lay it out for us. They're going to they're going to explain. So relax. We're going to get we're going to get all that good stuff. The code section defines an act in furtherance of the person's or entity's right of petition or free speech under the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of the state of Georgia in connection with an interest of public interest or concern. By the way, you watching this video and you sharing this video is actually helping the case. I'll explain why when when they get to it. Um, but yeah, um, we're helping. 
to include any written or oral statement or writing or petition made in connection with an issue under consideration or review by a legislative, executive, or judicial body, or any other official proceeding authorized by law, any written or oral statement or writing or petition made in a place open to the public or a public forum in connection with an issue of public interest or concern, or any other conduct in furtherance of the exercise of the constitutional right of petition or free speech in connection with a public issue or an issue of public concern. So there's two routes to get there, and one of them seems a lot harder than the other, but they're going to have some, they're going to have some analysis. The statute is intended to protect persons exercising their constitutional right of petition and freedom of speech. To accomplish this goal, the statute is to be construed broadly. It's going to protect more speech, not less speech. Um, this is good for Caffeinated Kitty. And this is really just Caffeinated Kitty's response. We're only getting that preview. There's going to be additional filings for Becca and for the host of the Do We Know Them podcast. So... All right. I don't mean to like diminish them. It's just easier to say. So with respect to both plaintiffs claim uh, claims against caffeinated kitty, there can be no question that they're based on statements made by caffeinated kitty in a public forum. Cause like the internet is a public forum. It's kind of the exemplar these days, um, in connection with a public issue or an interest of public concern. The complaint alleges that the statements were made in videos posted on social media platforms, including TikTok, as well as on an online donation platform called GoFundMe. I love the way legal filing is like, an online donation platform called GoFundMe, like we haven't heard of it. Um, I mean, maybe the court hasn't, but it's still funny. The complaint also alleges that the videos containing the alleged defamatory statements were viewed approximately 920,000 times. Those are good numbers doing some numbers on that. Awesome. And over 263,000 times. So more than a million in total. Excellent numbers. Um, social media and online platforms are considered public forums uh, for purposes of anti-slap statutes. And they cite some case law. I don't, I don't think this will be controversial, but there, you still cite the case law. So to determine whether an issue is an issue of public concern under the statute, courts consider whether the subject of the speech or activity was a person or entity in the public eye or could affect large numbers of people beyond the direct participants, and whether the activity occurred in the context of an ongoing controversy, dispute, or discussion, or affected a community in a manner similar to that of a governmental entity. Okay, so does this qualify? They say an issue of public interest is any issue in which the public is interested. In other words, the issue need not be significant to be protected by the anti-slap statute. It's en it is enough that it is one in which the public takes an interest. So I said, we're helping. Um, how are we helping? Because we're the public. I mean, I'm the public, you're the public, we're all the public, and we're taking an interest. So like, Hit the like button and the subscribe and all of those things. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got to do it. It's a YouTube channel. But um, by taking an interest, because Janet and Lauren have made themselves so ridiculously mockable. I mean, this isn't like caffeinated kitty's fault or anybody's fault. It's Lauren and Janet's fault for making themselves hilarious. We're taking an interest. And... Um, that helps get you to anti-slap protection. So we're helping. It's it's awesome. As to Propson's claims, the complaint alleges that Propson maintains a famous social media persona with millions of followers on TikTok, as well as sponsorships and a brand partnership with a famous documentary channel. Hmm, that sounds like public interest, right? Thus, she is certainly in the public eye. The complaint also alleges that Caffeinated Kitty explained that her statements were made as the result of confusion between Caffeinated Kitty and Propson by social media followers, and Caffeinated Kitty did not want to be confused with a social media persona, with millions of followers, who liked transphobic and hateful rhetoric. Thus, the public issue implicated by Caffeinated Kitty's alleged statements is the confusion between two social media personas, who are undoubtedly in the public eye, because, of course, they're also alleging that Caffeinated Kitty is super popular. Because she is. Um, one of which has liked and followed other social media personas whose content creates trans or contains 
transphobic, and hateful rhetoric. Whether Propson, who has millions of social media followers for her educational videos about death and the loss of loved ones, I love that these are quotations, but they're, you know, whose educational videos, I, I just love that, uh, likes and follows other social media personalities who post transphobic and hateful rhetoric is certainly a matter of public interest, particularly when the public is confusing caffeinated kitty and Propson. Um, yeah. So holding that statements made regarding a former president of a corporation in connection with a controversy that would affect the more than 13,000 members of the corporation is of legitimate public concern. 13,000, right? Um, did you see up there we had more than a million? I, I mean, I got into law because I suck at math. It's a very common route to becoming a lawyer. It's like, be semi-smart, suck at math, yada, 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 lawyer is like, that's the origin story for a ton of lawyers. So somebody in the chat, check my math, is more than a million a larger number than 13,000? I feel like it is. So any action involving such a large number of people is by definition a matter of public interest and concern. 13,000 is such a large number of people. How's, how's a million? As for Braun's claims against Caffeinated Kitty, they're also based on protected activity by Caffeinated Kitty. By the way, I don't want to, like, the people who are going to see that sequence and send me, like, investment opportunities, no. <laughs> Namely, Braun's allegations are based on purported statements that Caffeinated Kitty accused Braun of filing a bad faith copyright strike or complaint under the DMCA against Caffeinated Kitty, i.e. the filing or the DMCA copyright strike complaint was unfounded or in bad faith because of the use of alleged copy her because it constituted fair use. Um, and here's the thing. Why didn't you file for the copyright? Don't you think you were acting in good faith? Okay. As explained above, uh, it provides that any written or oral statement or writing or petition made in connection with an issue under consideration or review by a legislative, executive, or judicial body, which isn't what we're talking about here, or, and then in bold, any other official proceeding authorized by law is deemed a protective, protected activity under the Georgia statute. So this statute creates an expansive definition of protected speech that includes any statement made in connection with an issue under consideration by any official proceeding, which they're saying includes the filing of a complaint or copyright strike under the DMCA constitutes an official proceeding as it is expressly authorized by law. And they cite Kibler uh, versus Northern Ontario Inyo County Local Hospital District holding that hospital peer review constitutes an official proceeding under anti-slap because it is authorized by the California Business and Professions Clo Code. So, also another one that looked into investigations by State University into employee allegations. Now, I'm just going to note, um, and that was because they had statutory authority. I'm just going to note the DMCA thing is not a direct parallel. It's not a one-to-one. -one. This is a reasoning by analogy thing. But I think this is a good reasoning by analogy because if it goes into like workplace misconduct allegations, then why not a DMCA filing? Because it specifically authorizes and outlines the procedure for filing the complaint or copyright strike with an online service provider. Thus, it constitutes an official proceeding authorized by law. And caffeinated kitty's alleged statements made in connection with that official proceeding, i.e. that it was filed in bad faith, is protected under the Georgia anti-slap statute. This also pushes some of Janet's chips into the center of the pile, and I'm going to explain why. Janet does a whole lot of DMCA stuff. It's part of her, part of her business, right? And so um, that this creates the possibility that now all of those DMCA claims are going to start triggering anti-slap statutes. So Janet is risking getting a decision here that agrees with this line of reasoning, which would be very bad for Janet's business. 
Now, how does Janet avoid this? Well, um, either she wins on this issue, which is a possibility, or the way she can be certain of avoiding it is she drops the thing. And I've been saying there's all sorts of reasons why Janet might want to chew her leg off rather than be trapped in this particular bear trap. This adds another one. We're just putting in a little uh, tally mark in that queue. Furthermore, the statements are also protected as public statements of a public issue of or public concern. So the other branch of the of that statute, again, the complaint alleges that Propson has millions of social media followers. Thus, whether she's hired an attorney to file copyright claims and slash or strikes against content creators simply because they post content that Braun's clients, including Propson, do not like, is a matter of public interest and concern. And they cite a case holding that a blog post asserting that a public defender had charged an indigent criminal defendant a fee for public defense services was protected under anti-slap statutes. That, that seems really directly relevant, right? The activities of the lawyer can be a matter of public concern. Because caffeinated kitty statements are protected activity under the uh, statute, she satisfied the first step of the anti-slap inquiry as to both plaintiffs. So, the next thing is going to be whether or not there's any actual validity to the claims. Like, could the plaintiffs win or are there lawsuits just BS that is being thrown into the wind as a means to sort of back people off? Well, let's have a look. There's no probability that plaintiffs can prevail on their claims because they're legally insufficient. So in order to successfully make out defamation and all of the other things basically hinge on the defamation, you have to have fairly specific pleadings. I recently covered the case of Ari Jacob suing Taylor Lorenz and having most of the claims thrown out because Ari Jacob is a public figure. And because of that, they had to get to actual malice, which is fairly difficult to establish. You can't just say that there's malice. You've got to actually have some basis for it. So once a defendant has established that the claims asserted against it arise out of protected activity, as caffeinated kitty has done here, the burden then shifts on the plaintiff to demonstrate that there is a probability that the plaintiff will prevail on his or her claims. Not merely a possibility. It's not just like we could imagine a universe where this happens, one where we don't live, but you know, we could imagine it. It's got to be that they're sort of likely to do so. In federal district court, an anti-slap motion may be premised on legal deficiencies inherent in the plaintiff's claim, analogous to a motion to dismiss under the federal rules of civil procedure. And if a defendant makes a special motion to strike based on alleged deficiencies in the plaintiff's complaint, the motion must be treated in the same manner as a motion to dismiss, except that the attorney's fees provision of the anti-slap statute applies. So basically, it's like asking to dismiss for, you know, the claim has no merit, but it also, if you win, you get your lawyer's fees paid, which is nice. Um, I'm guessing, based on the skill and the research, that their lawyer is not cheap. Um, I don't think this is, like, I don't think this guy's a lawyer that you get out of, like, a cereal box. Um, unlike maybe some other lawyers. So, in determining whether a complaint satisfies Rule 12b-6, the court accepts the facts stated in the complaint as true and draws reasonable inferences in plaintiff's favor. Why do we do this? Well, because the plaintiff hasn't had the opportunity to call evidence yet, and so we assume the best out of their case. Though a complaint need not contain detailed factual allegations, a formulaic recitation of the elements of a cause of action will not do. You can't just say, oh, we're, we have to accomplish A, we plead that A happened. You have to say why you think A happened. So, rather, the complaint must contain enough facts to state a claim to relief that is plausible on its face. A complaint fails to state a claim where the well-pleaded facts do not permit the court to infer more than the mere possibility of misconduct. Here, as explained below, plaintiffs have failed to state facts sufficient to constitute any cause of action against Caffeinated Kitty, thus each of the claims should be strucken, or stricken under the Georgia Anti-Slap and attorney's fees under that statute should be awarded to Caffeinated Kitty, i.e. throw this crap out and give us all the money. So, first... Braun cannot prevail on her defamation claim. 
To state a claim for defamation under Illinois law, a plaintiff must plead facts showing, one, the defendant made a false statement concerning the plaintiff, two, there was an unprivileged publication of the defamatory statement to a third party by defendant, and three, publication of the defamatory statement damaged the plaintiff. So here the complaint alleges that Caffeinated Kitty defamed Braun by publicly stating that Ms. Braun filed false copyright lawsuits and by implying that she was acting as an attorney without being hired by Lauren the Mortician. I don't think that happened. I think she just said, hey, um, I don't know if you've been hired, but if you haven't, that would be real dumb. That's not, a, that's not implying that she hasn't. It's asking the question. You're allowed to ask people a question. And she used her platform to attack Braun's character and reputation. The complaint also alleges that Caffeinated Kitty stated that Braun filed bad faith copyright strikes against her and that Braun was accused of being an unethical lawyer that files frivolous copyright claims. As a preliminary matter, allegations that Caffeinated Kitty defamed Braun by using her platform to attach, attack Braun's character and reputation do not state a claim for defamation under Illinois law. There's various ways you can attack somebody's character and reputation that aren't defamatory. I can say Braun is silly. That's, that's not defamatory. It's a statement of opinion. I think she's very silly. I think she has made some dumb choices. Yeah. Defamation per se claim must be pled with a heightened level of precision and particularity. This higher standard is premised upon an important policy consideration, namely that a properly pled defamation per se claim relieves the plaintiff of proving actual damages. So defamation versus defamation per se. There's certain categories of defamation that fit under per se defamation that are presumed to cause damage. It's just damage is part of that. Whereas other forms of defamation that don't fall into that, you have to show that you actually lost stuff as a result. So that's an important distinction. So, and they cite a case holding that plaintiffs do not identify any particular statement that forms the basis for this allegation. This imprecision leaves defendants and this court guessing as to which statements are at issue and dismissing claims of defamation per se and false light based on an allegation for lack of specificity. I, you have to say this specific phrase. If you remember the depth trial, um, the depth trial went and hinged around very specific quotations. And those quotations end up being, you know, critical to all of this. Thus, the vague allegation that Caffeinated Kitty attacked Braun's character and reputation without precise identification of the actual words used cannot state a claim for defamation. You have to say which precise words are at issue. As for the allegations that Caffeinated Kitty defamed Braun by stating that Braun files false copyright lawsuits, or bad faith copyright strikes or claims, they're also patently defective. A little bit of snark there. As a preliminary matter, both the TikTok posts and the GoFundMe website re referenced in the complaint make clear that Casey is of the opinion that Braun had no grounds to file a copyright strike against her. And opinions are not actionable under defamation. I can be of the opinion that Braun sucks. And... I am of that opinion, but that's not defamatory. In fact, I can just outright say, Braun sucks. I can say that lots of times. I'm, I might say that lots of times. Um, I can say Braun is hilarious. I can say all sorts of things. So, um, the transcript of the TikTok post reveals that nowhere in the TikTok post does Caffeinated Kitty actually state that Braun filed bad faith or false copyright claims or copyright strikes against her. Rather, the only reference to the copyright strikes filed against Caffeinated Kitty by Braun in the TikTok post is Caffeinated Kitty's statement that she found the copyright strikes to be bizarre. Now, finding it to be bizarre is obviously opinion. So while the complaint reflects an alleged screenshot from a November 21st uh, TikTok post with the text in bad faith copyright infringement strikes uh, imposed over an image of caffeinated kitty, that text is not reflected in the video itself, a link to which plaintiffs failed to include or cite to in the complaint. That's here in the, uh, in the footnote. Um, 
Just as a note, when a lawyer points out that the other side has failed to include or cite to something, it's kind of suggesting that they might have had a reason for it. Like, hey, you guys are hiding the ball. Hmm, here's the ball. And the ball says, you suck. So, moreover, nowhere in the TikTok post or the GoFundMe page does Caffeinated Kitty state that the copyright strike filed against her was in bad faith or accused Braun of being or of being an unethical lawyer who files frivolous copyright claims. I, you can't put words into someone else's mouth and say they're defamatory. Like, that's not how that works. Likewise, the screenshot of the GoFundMe page posted by Caffeinated Kitty reveals a letter from Caffeinated Kitty to Braun with the subject line, false copyright claim, and states only that Caffeinated Kitty and her team would love further details on your client and how the video had grounds for a copyright strike, as it clearly falls under fair use. A party who has been sued or otherwise had a legal proceeding instituted against him or her is certainly permitted to express their disagreement with the merits of the proceeding without being liable for defaming their, the opposing counsel, as such a statement is a non-actionable opinion, i.e., if I get sued and I say this law sh lawsuit is bullshit, then that's not defamatory. That's just me saying, I think this lawsuit is bullshit. That's an opinion. So yeah. A statement is constitutionally protected opinion if it cannot reasonably be interpreted as stating actual facts about the plaintiff when viewed from the perspective of an ordinary reader. To determine whether a statement is factual in nature, Illinois courts consider whether the statement has a precise and readily understood meaning, whether the statement is verifiable, and whether the statement's literary or social context signals that it has factual content. If it is clear that the speaker is expressing a subjective view or interpretation, such as when the speaker discloses the facts forming the basis for the statement, the statement is not actionable as defamation. Here, it is clear that Caffeinated Kitty is expressing her subjective opinion that the copyright claim had no grounds based on her opinion that the defense of fair use is applicable. I share Caffeinated Kitty's opinion. Furthermore, use of a term false or even bad faith, assuming Caffeinated Kitty even used that phrase, which we don't, has no precise and readily understood meaning. And so they cite to a case that notes the phrase Deeply greedy people has no precise meaning and is not verifiable. Further, the context in which that phrase appeared uh, indicates that it may have been judgmental, but it was not factual. This statement is not actionable. So you can say, for instance, that Jeanette Braun seems like a deeply greedy person. And that's not actionable. That's just, that's the example. So, the terms false or bad faith are so broad in scope that they lack the necessary detail to have a precise and readily understood meaning uh, required to be actionable. Now, this is in fact shown by some of Janet's own postings, because Janet talks about false copyright strikes as implying that somebody doesn't actually own the copyright, but that's only one interpretation of a false copyright strike. A false copyright strike could also mean this was improper because what I'm doing is under fair use or a license or whatever else. I get copyright claims on my channel all the time because I use a music licensing service. And so sometimes I get claims for you use this song, we want the money. And I say, well, hold, hold the phone. I license this. And they go, oh, sorry. Those were false claims, right? They were false claims. I'm not alleging that they were like improper or they did something, you know, they were annoying, but yeah. So there's another case that held that the term incompetent is a non-actionable opinion because there are numerous reasons why one, one might conclude that another is incompetent. One person's idea of one when one reaches the threshold of incompetence will vary from the next person's. So not specifically, spe you know, particular. Another case holding that statements that plaintiff's actions were unethical and deceitful are plainly subjective, not objectively verifiable, and not actionable. What does it mean for a claim to be false or in bad faith, and how would one verify that? Courts can and do routinely disagree over whether particular claims have merit. That's why we have appeals courts, right? You lose at one level, you win at appeal, like, this happens. 
to hold caffeinated Kitty liable for expressing her opinion regarding the merits of the copyright strike filed against her by Braun would open any litigant up to liability for defamation if they spoke publicly regarding the merits of the proceedings filed against them. This is not and cannot be the law. How many times have you seen somebody who's getting sued make a statement publicly that says, I think this suit has no merit? Like, um, always. <laughs> Lots of times, right? Nobody's going to say, I've been sued and I think it's totally a great lawsuit and they're going to win. Even if that's what ends up happening. So, and in fact, often when people lose, they make a statement saying, we still think that this lawsuit was BS. Finally, Braun's allegation that Caffeinated Kitty defamed her by implying she was acting as an attorney without being hired by Lauren the Mortician is also a non-actionable opinion. I don't think that was actually what she was saying either. Both the transcript of the TikTok post and the GoFundMe page make clear that Caffeinated Kitty thought that Propson may not have hired Braun as her attorney. And to be fair, if I received that cease and desist, I probably would have been like, are you sure you are a lawyer? Because this looks like it was written by a particularly obnoxious variant of ChatGPT. Yeah, it's like if ChatGPT was programmed to be a dick. So, yeah. So when this first uh, started to the attorney, I didn't think that it was someone, or actually someone Lauren hired. So like I said, I thought Jeanette had just gone rogue and had not actually been hired. Thought, 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 opinion, right? While I understand your desire to protect a creator you enjoy, if you were not legally obtained as uh, counsel for her, and I speak on this via my platform, your actions are going to cause her significantly more strife. That would be correct, right? Um, if I decided to suddenly pretend to be Mr. Beast's lawyer and send out some insane, um, you know, insane cease and desist to like anybody who sells burgers, Mr. Beast would, I mean, people might hold that against him and Mr. Beast would probably sue me into oblivion and probably make a video of like hitting me in the face with something like, or pranking me in some way. Like, come on. Um, so if it is clear that the writer is exploring a subjective view, an interpretation, a theory, conjecture, or surmise, rather than claiming to be in possession of objectively verifiable facts, the statement is not actionable. So she's theorizing. Are you really a, the lawyer or not? Not actionable. So another case, they cite finding non-actionable opinion when the statement was, uh, was not couched in terms of a factual assertion, but rather as conjecture. You're allowed to conjecture about things like, hey, what if? Moreover, social contexts are a major determinant of whether an ordinary reader would view an alleged defamatory statement as constituting fact or opinion. The fact that these statements were made on the internet and social media posts further underscores that they constitute an opinion. And they have a footnote here saying courts have emphasized the generally informal and unedited nature of statements made on the internet. And in fact, we have memes about this. Do you think somebody would just go on the internet and tell lies? And the joke is that, yes, that is what we do. We think people on the internet are coming up with all sorts of random stuff, right? That is the internet. Um, so the culture of internet communications, as distinct from that of print media, such as newspapers and magazines, has been characterized as encouraging a freewheeling, anything goes writing style. Social media platforms are equally, if not more, informal and freewheeling, and as such convey a strong signal to a reasonable reader that a statement is opinion. Um, very little out there is, you know, yeah. People post on Twitter their random opinions. So not only are caffeinated kitties statements about Braun non-actionable opinions, but they're also subject to a qualified privilege under Illinois law. So privilege would mean even if otherwise they were defamatory, they're protected. Such a privilege may exist where the situation involves an interest of the person who publishes the defamatory statement or an interest of the person to whom the matter is published. Courts also recognized as privileged communications involving a recognized public interest. So whether a qualified privilege exists is a question of law for the court. Caffeinated Kitty statements are privileged because they relate to her interest in protecting her freedom of speech in her social media posts. I think that's pretty obvious. 
and in not being subject to DMCA copyright strikes filed by Braun in response to statements made on social media with which Braun's clients disagree. Yep. Moreover, the statements made by Caffeinated Kitty were published to those who share that interest, i.e. other individuals who have social media accounts who have been or could be subject to DMCA copyright strikes filed by Braun. There's a reason why I don't use any Braun clips other than like some really narrow, absolutely fair use slash fair dealing protected materials. I'm very careful about that because I think she might come knocking at my door and I don't want that to happen. So I'm, I'm cautious. Um, so once qualified immunity has been identified, a plaintiff may overcome this challenge at the pleading stage by alleging the statement was made with actual malice. Actual malice doesn't mean like you're twirling your mustache as you've got a woman tied to the tracks, right? Um, so they're going to define it. Either knowledge of its falsity or in reckless disregard of the truth. So you either knew it was a lie or you thought maybe, but you just didn't care. So courts in this district, however, have looked for something more than conclusory statements in order to infer the defendant knew the statements were untrue or recklessly disregarded the truth or falsity of its statement of the statements. You can't just say that. You have to actually have some evidence. Um, in the Jacob and Taylor Lorenz case, the court actually, for one of the counts, one was not thrown out, and that was because Taylor Lorenz had said, hey, I don't believe this is true, and then published it anyway. Like, put that in writing. I don't think that we have that here. Here, the complaint contains nothing more than conclusory statement that caffeinated kitties' defamatory statements were made with knowledge of their falsity and with a reckless disregard for the truth, i.e., just stating the test, but not how we get there. There are no facts alleged to support this boilerplate allegation, and without such facts, Braun cannot overcome application of the qualified privilege. Because Braun's claims for defamation asserted by Braun against Caffeinated Kitty are not legally sufficient, and Braun cannot satisfy its burden under the Georgia anti-slap statute of demonstrating a probability of prevailing on the claim. So, next up, Propson cannot prevail on her defamation claim. We've heard why Braun's going to lose. Now we're going to hear why Lauren the Mortician's going to lose. So the complaint alleges that Caffeinated Kitty defamed Propson by publicly stating in the TikTok post that Propson was a turf and transphobic and used her platform to allege Propson's character and reputation. Now, right at the beginning, turf and transphobic opinion, right? There is prior case law to that. What is a turf? I don't know, where's the cutoff for turfness? Is there like a specific line of turf versus no turf? Um, unless you're talking about T-U-R-F and, you know, that's when the field starts? No. Turf is opinion. Uh, transphobic is opinion. What does it mean to be transphobic? You know, I don't know. Like, obviously somebody who, like, sees a trans person and runs away screaming in terror is transphobic. But what about somebody who, you know, whatever. I don't know where the line is. I think different people are going to think the line is in different places. So the complaint alleges that the false statements were defamation per se because the harm to plaintiff's reputation is obvious and apparent on its face. Being called a transphobic is akin to being called a bigot or racist, which is which are comments that courts have said were not defamatory, so that's a weird thing. Because the complaint alleges that Propson is a citizen and resident of Wisconsin, Wisconsin law governs the substantive issues of Propson's claims. And they're going to get to some fun things about jurisdiction. As explained above, in connection with Braun's defamation claim, allegations of caffeinated kitty defame Propson by using her platform to attack Propson's character and reputation fail because Propson has failed to identify any particular statement that forms the basis for this allegation. You can't just say they were attacking my reputation. Also note, the footnote, in the event that the court finds that Illinois law governs a determination of the legal sufficiency of Propson's claim, Caffeinated Kitty has cited applicable Illinois law in connection with the analysis of Braun's claims, which would apply here. So that's saving them a whole lot of writing with one footnote. So this imprecision leaves Caffeinated Kitty and the court guessing which statements are at issue and failed to plead the facts to support the claim with adequate specificity. So 
citing a case, dismissing a claim because the allegations are too vague and conclusory as to the actual content of the alleged defamatory statements. Why are they citing new cases? Because Wisconsin now, not Illinois, now Wisconsin. Um, so, and yeah, also citing Patterson and World Wrestling Enter Entertainment, noting that a complaint alleging def defamation must set forth the particular words complained of. You got to have a quote. Where's the quotes? Where's the quotes? You can't just talk about general vibes. You can't sue for defamatory vibes. But they want to sue for vibes. So, yeah. As for the allegation, the caffeinated kitty stated Propson was a TERF, which the complaint alleges stands for trans exclusionary radical feminist, described as someone who is hostile to the inclusion of trans women in the feminist movement. That statement is pure opinion and non-actionable under both Wisconsin and Illinois law. So again, it's opinion. It's opinion. They say it is not possible to prove that Propson is not someone who is hostile to the exclusion or the inclusion of trans women in the feminist movement. Whether Propson is or is not hostile to trans women is entirely subjective and could vary from person to person. Yeah, what does it mean to be hostile? So, all right. Further, as the Seventh Circuit has held, words that are mere name-calling or found to be rhetorical hyperbole or employed only in a loose figurative sense have been deemed non-actionable. I can say Lauren the Mortician is a poopy head and there ain't shit she can do about it. So, I think I just did. So, um, yeah. As for the complaints, allegation that Caffeinated Kitty defamed Propson by stating she was transphobic, a transcript of the TikTok post reveals that Caffeinated Kitty never called Propson transphobic. Which, it's gotta be a quote, right? Not vibes. So, not once in the TikTok post does Caffeinated Kitty use the word transphobic, nor does she ever accuse Propson of disliking or being prejudiced against transgender individuals. Rather, the transcript uh, demonstrates that Caffeinated Kitty stated only that Propson was following and actively liking social media posts by individuals who posted incredibly transphobic and hateful rhetoric. Note that those that's a difference, right? Nowhere in this in the complaint does Propson allege that this statement is false, i.e. that she did not follow and actively like act in her social media posts by these particular individuals. And the TikTok post reveals that Propson actually did like and follow these individuals. So... Yeah, and they cite, they have a footnote here saying that the court can consider the transcript in determining the legal sufficiency. So, this is a problem because ultimately the court may rule, like, as a statement from the court, that Lauren the Mortician did like and follow those individuals. And at that point, it's not just, you know, at that point, um, Caffeinated Kitty has a court ruling to support the TikTok video. And the next TikTok video that she would make about it, because I bet she would. And also the videos I would make about it, because I know I would, because I know me pretty well. Um, we've been hanging out for some years. So given that the statement that props and follows and likes these social media posts is not false, it cannot form the basis for a defamation claim. As explained above, because Propson does not identify any particular statement that forms the basis for her transphobic allegation, the defamation claim based on this allegation must be dismissed for lack of specificity. So, yeah, even if Propson had pled any facts supporting the allegation that Caffeinated Kitty had accused Propson of being transphobic, which she did not, such a statement is not capable of being proven false and therefore is not actionable. So they note a case where generally calling someone a chauvinist or a racist is a non-actionable statement of opinion. Accusations of concrete wrongful conduct are actionable, while general statements charging a person with being racist, unfair, or unjust are not. So use of the terms rob and cheat were non-actionable opinions under Wisconsin law. And mere name calling is not actionable as defamation under Illinois law. Moreover, Propson's defamation per se claim against Caffeinated Kitty should be dismissed because accusing someone of being a TERF or transphobic is not one of the specific categories of statements that fall within the definition of defamation per se, 
under either Wisconsin or Illinois law. And so they must fall within four specific categories to be considered slanders per se under Wisconsin law. Category one, imputation of certain crimes. Well, um, I'm not sure what those certain crimes are offhand, but I also know that transphobic is not a crime. So that's out. Allegations affecting one's business, trade, profession, or office. Um, those are things like saying, you know, so-and-so is, you know, a banker who steals from their clients, those kinds of things. Imputation of a loathsome disease. Um, what's a loathsome disease? Well, generally that means like, um, the diseases you might get like sh south of the belt line and north of the knees, that kind of region. Or imputation of unchastity to a woman. I don't think that was the claim. I don't think anyone cares anymore. Um, yeah. Thus, Propson must plead specific allegations of special damages resulting from the defamation, which the complaint fails to do. So, what, you know, she doesn't fall in those categories. How did this actually hurt you? And general allegations of harm to Propson's career, profession, and reputation, or allegations of emotional distress are insufficient to adequately plead special damages. Likewise, a conclusory allegation that Propson lost a contract with a famous documentary channel without any supporting facts explaining that she lost the contract because of the alleged defamation is insufficient to plead special damages. And I think Lauren and Braun have a real problem here. The real problem that they have is that their own actions are actions that are really the kind of actions people might shun you over. For instance, I would not do business with someone I thought made a false wellness check. That's not the kind of people I want to hang out with. Um, it's not the kind of people I want to be associated with. So, um, yeah, um, that is just, so when there's the problem of, is it the defamation that's causing you this damage? Or is it you going off the rails that's causing you this damage and people hearing about it? You're going to have a real hard time dealing with special damages. So, yeah. Plaintiffs cannot prevail on their false light and trade libel claims. So why? Because they've failed to state a claim for defamation against Caffeinated Kitty. Their false light claims arising out of the same allegations of defamation must fail. Basically, you've got a house of cards. We knock out the bottom layer of defamation. The top layer of false light and trade libel also goes to the, uh, also goes to the ground. Also, Wisconsin does not recognize a claim for false light. And Lauren's in, Wis <laughs> Lauren's in Wisconsin. So likewise, because plaintiff's trade libel claims against caffeinated kitty are nothing more than a restatement of the defamation claims and based on the same alleged false statements, they fail too. So plaintiffs cannot prevail on their tortious interference claims. So what is tortious interference? It's basically if I see that you are going to make a deal with somebody and I step in to mess with that deal in certain improper ways, then I can be on the hook, right? So Propson's claim for tortious interference against Caffeinated Kitty asserts that Caffeinated Kitty's alleged defamatory statements intentionally interfered with a contract Propson had with a famous and well-known documentary channel. Who? Who? Like, you're going to have to get us some specifics if you want to get there. Braun has likewise asserted a claim for tortious interference with existing and potential business relationships against Caffeinated Kitty based on allegations that Caffeinated Kitty's purported defamatory statements have caused and are likely to cause the public and content creators not to employ Braun for legal representation. Now, I'm not going to tell you who you should and shouldn't hire, but I can say that I personally would not continue employing Braun after she filed a false you know, or what appears to me to be a false wellness check. And I've seen her reasons. You know, she says it was for extortion. I don't think that was extortion. So, yeah, both claims are legally deficient. As a preliminary matter, both claims for tortious interference are based on plaintiff's non-actionable allegations of defamation. Furthermore, under Wisconsin law, which applies to Propton's claim, 
A claim for tortious interference with a contractual relationship requires the plaintiff to allege the defendant acted with a purpose to interfere with the contract. It's not just that you did something that happens to interfere with the contract. You have to have intended to do it. And how would Caffeinated Kitty have known about Lauren's plans to work with this documentary channel in order to want to interfere with it? She wouldn't. This is ridiculous. This is dumb. So, if an actor lacks the purpose to interfere, then his or her conduct does not subject him or her to liability, even if it has the unintended effect of deterring a third party from dealing with the plaintiff. Necessarily, to be subject to liability for tortious interference with a contract, the actor must have knowledge of the contract with which he is interfering, and the fact that he is interfering with the performance of the contract. Lauren hadn't told caffeinated kitty that she was involved in these negotiations and the caffeinated kitty might mess with it and so you're done that's it the complaint alleges no facts establishing that caffeinated kitty knew about propson's alleged contract with the documentary channel and that she acted with the purpose of interfering with that contract did did lauren announce this i don't think so because normally you can't announce these things until it's a done deal but i don't know even if she had announced it, you'd have to prove that Caffeinated Kitty saw the announcement. That's going to be tough. And they didn't even try. So, rather the complaint relies on nothing more than conclusory and insufficient allegations devoid of any facts. Indeed, the complaint makes clear that Caffeinated Kitty's motivation in making the statements about Propson on TikTok was to clear up confusion between Propson and Caffeinated Kitty, not to interfere with a contract between Propson and the documentary channel, i.e., I want to make it real clear, I ain't her. I don't care about her business dealings, but I ain't her. Moreover, the complaint is devoid of any factual allegations establishing that Caffeinated Kitty's statements were the cause of the documentary's channel's termination of its contract with Propson. You can't just say one thing happens and then another thing happens, therefore magic, and they're the same. Um, because I can tell you that before I was born... Um, you know, America was colonized. That is not a direct cause of my birth. Um, I mean, it might be a precondition, but it wasn't the cause. Um, yeah, the moon landing didn't cause, you know, didn't cause me to post this video. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, this is a problem. Braun's tortious interference claim is equally deficient. <laughs> I love it. Under Illinois law, which applies to Braun's claim, a claim for tortious interference with prospective economic advantage requires that plaintiffs show, one, their reasonable expectation of entering into a valid business relationship, two, defendants' knowledge of that expectancy, and three, purposeful interference by the defendants preventing that expectancy from being fulfilled, and four, damages resulting from such interference. Braun's going to have a real problem with this because she's a lawyer, right? And so she would have to show that there are specific people who reached out to her in order to form some sort of, you know, economic agreement and then backed out of that based on these comments. However, any such discussion that a prospective client had with Ms. Braun or her firm would be privileged and that privilege would belong to the client. So Braun doesn't have the authority to put that into a lawsuit without a waiver of privilege from the client who doesn't want to do business with her and thus has no reason to give her that waiver of privilege. That's a real mess for Braun. How are you going to get by that? Let's see what, what, how she's going to get around that. Because, I mean, this is a real puzzle. Braun fails to allege any specific facts regarding the existing or prospective relationships with which Caffeinated Kitty allegedly interfered Rather, the complaint on alleges only conclusory allegations that Caffeinated Kitty has caused the public and content creators not to employ Braun. Okay. Um, so the way she gets around the privilege problem is she doesn't get around the privilege problem. She just fails. And I can say, what Caffeinated Kitty had to say doesn't make me think, oh, that's why I don't want to hire Braun. What Braun had to say on a recorded conversation with the police is why I wouldn't hire Braun. I mean, you make your choices, but this is my feelings. As, you know, this is 
me talking about my opinions and my emotions. So per the complaint, the interference claim could be based on any member of the public. There are no specific relationships identified and no facts alleging that caffeinated kitty knew of these potential or existing relationships. Such conclusory allegations are too vague to state a viable claim for tortious interference under Illinois law. Um, I've also seen like Braun cease and desist. I didn't like it. I posted videos about it. I didn't like it. So, so yeah, moreover, Braun has no alleged facts to support any allegation that members of the public have failed to employ Braun for legal representation as a result of caffeinated kitty statements. Again, she would have to breach privilege to do that. Instead, the complaint relies on a conclusory assertion that caffeinated kitty statements have caused or are likely to continue to cause people not to hire Braun. Which people? When? How much money did you lose? Those are questions like that you need to answer if you want to have a claim. You can't just, you know, faff into the wind. That simply is not enough to state a claim for tortious interference. So, yeah, they're saying that they're citing case law talking about things that are too attenuative and too speculative and vague to state a plausible entitlement to relief. So, Propson cannot prevail on her intentional infliction of emotional distress claim. I don't even want to read this because that claim was such bullshit. Um, it was so ridiculous. But because she's failed to state a claim for defamation, she's also failed to state a claim for emotional distress. And yeah, um, there is no probability that they will succeed. And so they should be stricken and attorney's fees awarded. Alternatively, plaintiff's claim should be dismissed under the federal rules of civil court or civil procedure. So Plaintiffs are not entitled, are not likely to prevail under any of their nine causes of action because they're legally insufficient. In the event that the court determines that the uh, that the conduct is not protected under anti-slap, then it still should be dismissed because they have no they have no merit, they have no basis to survive. So maybe they don't get attorney's fees, but it should still be thrown out. Fair. Um, alternatively. Propson's claims should be dismissed as her claims have zero nexus to Illinois. I, this isn't an Illinois lawsuit. Now I commented when I was reviewing the lawsuit itself that it doesn't actually seem like Lauren's claims and Braun's claims have anything to do with each other other than the fact that they are people who have met. Um, but like the claims of defamation against Lauren are different than the claims of defamation against Braun because they have different, they're different people with different interests. So, yeah. A civil action is properly venued in a judicial district in which any defendant resides if all defendants reside in the state housing the district. A judicial district in which a substantial part of the events or omissions giving rise to the claim occurred, or if there's no such district in which the action may otherwise be brought, any judicial district in which any defendant is subject to the court's personal jurisdiction with respect to the action, so diversity jurisdiction. As explained above, two different plaintiffs have brought nine causes of action against caffeinated kitty, five by Propson and four by Braun, and venue must be proper as to each cause of action. So the rules of civil procedure allow a defendant to make a pre-answer motion to dismiss on the grounds of improper venue. Similarly, the rules allow a court to dismiss a case when venue is improper. So they can just throw it out, right? In fact, district courts often dismiss a case rather than transfer it because there's two options. One, they can say, we're sending this case to another jurisdiction. That happened in the GWAX case that I was talking about in previous videos. Um, but they can also just throw it out and say goodbye. So in fact, district courts often dismiss a case rather than transfer it under the section if the plaintiff's attorney reasonably could have foreseen that the forum in which the suit was filed was improper and that similar conduct should be discouraged. Hmm. Could Ben have determined that this was improper? Well, yes. Here, venue is improper with respect to Propson's claims against Caffeinated Kitty because Propson is a resident of Wisconsin, Caffeinated Kitty is a resident of Georgia, 
and none of the claims asserted by Propson against caffeinated kitty have any connection to the state of Illinois, i.e. no statements made in Illinois or directed at Illinois, no injury in Illinois, nothing in Illinois. The only thing in Illinois is bronze in Illinois. And I'm okay with that because Illinois is a long way away from me. So, indeed, as explained above, Illinois law does not apply to any of the claims asserted by Propson against caffeinated kitty. Propson should have filed this action in Wisconsin or Georgia, but she instead chose to tie her claims to those asserted by Braun for her own convenience. And so, does she have any other reason to do so? I don't see it. In fact, I had commented that it is really weird that the client and the lawyer have tied their claims together. That is very, very strange. And in fact, risks issues of privilege and so forth. So that's weird. That is not a reason for this court to decide this issue and dismissal of Propson's claims is warranted under 12b3. So for the foregoing reasons, Caffeinated Kitty respectfully requests that this court strike every count and award attorney's fees she's incurred in connection with this motion, or alternatively, dismiss every count, and alternatively, dismiss Propson's counts. Cool. Um, I like this response a lot better than I like the original filing, because, wow. Um, wow. So, um... What might, what do I think is likely to happen? Well, I'm going to say, I think that this filing might make me sad, might make me very sad. And the reason why it might make me sad is that personally, I have a different incentive than caffeinated kitty does. And this only is caffeinated kitty's response, right? There's other responses coming for Becca Day and the Do We Know Them podcast, like all of them, right? They have they're going to have different filings. This is only a preview that just deals with caffeinated kitty. And so, um, we're going to have, you know, we're going to have some different views. Caffeinated kitty would love for this to be thrown out with attorney's fees. Absolutely would love that. Um, me, I would love for this to go to trial, which of course is not in caffeinated kitty's interest at all. She's not going to push for that. Because I would love to see the court make a full ruling that the statements were true and that, um, you know, and that, for instance, the statement of rogue attorney is backed up by facts. That would be a hilarious ruling because that would make this lawsuit one of the own goaliest plays in the history of sports ball, legal sports ball. Um... But yeah, what I think is likely to happen is I think the court is going to first, um, I mean, they might punt this under the Georgia anti-slap, in which case caffeinated kitty gets paid and Lauren and <laughs> Lauren and Braun need to really rethink their strategy of what they can, can and can't do in order to manage reputations and manage copyright and just manage stuff online. They'd have to I mean, that becomes an expensive lesson. Um, but it might be that it gets punted with the option to refile and to amend their claims. Now, the court often gives permission to sort of try again, uh, but that permission eventually runs out. And some of these claims, I don't think there's any way to fix them because, you know, they got to get to a specific quote. Where's the specific quote that doesn't run afoul of problems like, transphobic not being actionable you know what does it mean to be a rogue lawyer i don't know that's pretty vague am i a rogue lawyer does it mean that i get like sneak attacks and maybe you know i can pick pockets for a little extra coin i don't know i mean that would be kind of cool climb walls this lawsuit is such a gong show and I'm really looking forward. I know that this is going to be like an hour and some minutes and thank you guys for putting up with me, but I'm really, really looking forward to getting the rest of this. Cause I mean, it's coming tomorrow. I'll probably be able to get to it on Saturday, but, um, <laughs> it, it's going to be Christmas. 
So thank you guys for watching. I hope you found this to be interesting or educational or um, sometimes the best lesson in life is just what not to do. You can learn by cautionary example. So thank you for watching. Um, I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Purple Dragon Air, CCFR, Canada's National Farm Association, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $20 level, uh, Lindsay Metcalf, Larry Kalniak, uh, Kyle Fox, uh, Drunk All of the Baileys, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, Vicky, and Dorky Dane. Thank you as well to my $10 supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following. My apologies if this was a little rough. I am out of voice. I'm out of sleep. Um, I've been doing the rust coverage, but I really wanted to share this with you guys. I'm really excited by all of this. So, um, so I've given up on sleep and recreation to bring this video to you. I hope you enjoy it, but um, I know it's a little rougher than usual. So thank you guys so much. Um, see you next time.